Good evening. Today I'm talking to Tracy. Hiya, Tracy. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Hello. I'm uh, Tracy Martin Summers. I originally come from Harrow Weald. That's a really tiny little offshoot of the bigger town Harrow, which uh, a lot more people would know. Um, I'm relatively new to Bedfordshire, which is where I now am. I moved there. I moved up there about eight years ago, but five years ago, I moved into a real sleepy little hamlet called um, Greenfield. So uh, I love it here. I've moved here with my husband and uh, it was the, one of the best things ever really moving here. I love it. It's um, tranquil and it's just such a nice setting really to live in and um, I'm right. So um, my main interest is writing, that's where my passion is. Um, it's something that I've probably always wanted to do. I dabble in landscape painting as well. I do um, landscapes, ballerinas, things like that, but um, that's not, that's just a release or something where I, I can sit and do in the sunshine and enjoy myself, but writing's what really gets me used to uh, write for children initially so that's uh, what I used to do um, before I started writing crime thrillers so that's about me in a nutshell I'm, I'm a mum I'm a mum of two grown-up children and I'm also a grandmother so I'm really proud to say so I'm very very busy with, with family life and um, if I'm not with my family, which is my main focus, and my husband, I'm writing. Busy, busy then. Very. Uh, did you always want to be a writer? I didn't know what I wanted to be initially, many years ago. Um, I used to write for my children. Well, when I say write, I used to make up little stories for them when they was little. Basically, what I used to do, you know what it's like, us mums, we're getting our kids ready for school and we're trying to get them to brush their teeth and to button up their shirts for school, etc. And to keep them focused and on channel, you know, on route, I used to uh, make up these little stories and I used to use it at dinner time to keep them at the table and to encourage them to eat their vegetables. And they used to uh, say to me, mummy, can you tell us a story about so-and-so? I had all these little uh, stories that I used to make up, little characters that become familiar to my children. And they used to love it. And sometimes I'd get a book out and they used to say, no, mummy, one of your stories, we want one of yours. <laughs> and I used, to, I used to say, oh, they really like my stories. This is great. And I thought one day I'd like to write a children's story. And I guess that was my first taste of wanting to, to write. But... Uh, being busy with the kids and family life, I, it kind of didn't happen for a long time. And it was only really a few years ago that I thought, you know, I'm going to put some of my ideas down on paper. And I started writing for children and I did actually publish my first uh, children's book. And I've got one actually coming out um, next month, I think it will be. Uh, the, the illustrations are uh, being done um, as we speak. So that, that's nearly ready. But um, yeah, so I guess, yes, I've always wanted to be a writer. I didn't think that I would be writing for grown-ups. So that's really <laughs> new and exciting. Um, have your daughters carried on that tradition of, with their children of telling them stories? Um, I've only got one granddaughter. So only one of my children's ha had a, a child so far. And she's very creative with her. She's, she's not yet three, so she's very, very young. But um, she does love books, my granddaughter. So she loves sitting down with a book and she's a, she's a bright little thing. We always say that, don't we? Oh, she's a bright little thing, but she is, she's absolutely adorable. And my daughter's a great mum to her. And uh, I'm quite certain that she's gonna start making up stories for her because uh, I, I can just see it. I really can. Oh, that's lovely. Um, so after the children's books, what made you decide to write crime? Ooh. Well, I don't, it, I didn't actually decide to write crime. I decided one day that I wanted to write for, for grown ups, real grown ups. And then I thought, oh, God, 
would I be good enough to write for a grown-up? It's really different when I'm writing my fluffy little characters, you know, that are embarking on a little forest journey or going up to Paris uh, in a, this wizardry world to write in um, something that uh, an adult would want to read. So my genre was the hardest thing to work out. I didn't know whether to do a romance. And I thought, oh my God, all those romantic scenes, sexual scenes and things like that, well, how, how would I deliver those? And, and I thought, no, I, I don't want to do that. I want to steer away from that. Maybe I'll do a mystery. And then I started thinking, oh God, no, everybody will start calling me Miss Marples. And I just didn't know what to do. And I was really exploring. And then I thought, hmm, I might do psychological crime. Schizophrenia has always been like really interesting. I've loved studying that type of thing. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to do a psychological crime, or at least I'm going to try to do a psychological crime. So that's what I did. I, I set out doing it. It was, it was a weird thing because I wrote a couple of pages of um, what, I, what was chapter one and I, it became quite medical really quickly and I was on the internet researching bits and bobs and then I thought, oh, this is going to be far too complex. And then some friends of ours um, came to stay with us for the weekend and I said, hey, I, I, you know, I think I'm going to write um, a psychological thriller and I've done a few pages of it. Would you just have a, a quick peep, have a look at it and see, um, see what you think? So my friend had a look and she went, well, what happens to her? <laughs> and I said, oh, well, even I don't know yet. She passed it to her husband. And they said, yeah, you know, go for it. So I finished um, chapter one and then we were due to um, fly out to Spain. And I was um, sitting on my balcony in Spain and I thought, right, let's do chapter two. So I was sitting in the sunshine under a big brolet, just sorted myself out of sangria and I was, you know, in the, in the zone and I kept looking over the balcony, you know, it was all very tranquil and I thought, right, let's, let's do this. And I wrote this, um, this chapter, so to speak, it took me quite some time to do it, most of the holiday. And I kept going back and I was fiddling around with it. And um, that, what was supposed to be chapter two, actually ended up being my prologue. Because I it was actually, because um, I was going to switch back and forward. I was going to start and then move on 40 years and then go back. And I was driving myself nuts, you know, working out how I was going to orchestrate that. So I actually ended up making um, chapter two, the prologue. So we started 40 years ago. And then I fast forwarded to um, the present time and the book takes place in 2019. Mm. So um, basically that, that's um, how that came about. And that's how Gordon Square, my, my first <laughs> debut novel was seeded. Really. It, it just that way, that's, that's how it came about. It's, it, people have asked me, you know, what made you, what made you do that? Where did the story come from? And it just grew really from, from the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> um, and have your family read the, your books? Yes, my husband is is brilliant. He is really supportive of me and very encouraging. And um, every time I do a few chapters, I say to him, "Have a little read, have a little read, see what you think." And he he gives me his opinion along the way. But he says that whilst he enjoys doing that and having an involvement, he likes it when he's got a printed novel in front of him. He said, you know, it, it's, he enjoys to read it that way when it because he reads it so fragmented throughout the process that and, and sometimes I go back and change and you know chop and change things. So when he actually then reads it when it's all been tied together and made all neat and pretty, well, if you can make a psychological thriller pretty, when it when it's all complete, he said that's the bit that he really loves. So yes, my, my husband is um, a, an avid fan. But um, my uh, daughter reads it, my son, and all my family members. My sister-in-law has been absolutely amazing, my sister-in-law, Tina. She reads um, everything I do, all my kids' stuff, and, uh, and she's absolutely been loving the uh, thriller series that I've been doing. Yeah, my family have been really supportive. Oh, that's amazing. 
And um, before we recorded, you said you were quite new to writing. So have you made lots of author friends? Not really, because um, up and I'm so new, so so new to this. And when I started writing, I didn't know anybody really. And um, I put my children's book in a local magazine. I don't know if you know it, living in Dunstable, you do the Oracle. Does it cover Dunstable? Yeah. And I was flicking through it one afternoon, sitting out in the garden, and I thought, oh, I wonder if I could put, you know, advertise my book in this. Anyway, I was chatting um, to the lady that does the magazine and um, sent her off all my bits and pieces, and she put an article in there. And I've forgotten the question. <laughs> Author <laughs> friends. Author <laughs> friends, that was it. So um, that led me to um, a lady that um, is part of a forum that I now belong to, because I, the reason I actually went forward to, to put my book in there was because she'd done the same thing. Which, so I got in touch with her and I said, uh, what else do you do, you know, to, to advertise, you know, because this is all so new. But she said, oh, well, I belong to a forum. Would you like to join? I can get you in touch with the guy that runs it. So he introduced, she introduced me to that. So I joined that forum. So that, that then thought, what other forums can I join? So I started looking around and joining crime forums and, um, so whilst I know people on Zoom meetings, because we do Zoom um, meetings, well, I, I'm part of the Amtil Writers Group, so we do a Zoom uh, meeting and, and things like that. So whilst I know people over Zoom, I'm so, so new to this that I don't actually know anybody face to face, um, you know, in, in the real world, so to speak. So. Uh, when, when we all actually meet when lockdown ends, uh, it would be nice to be able to chat with, with other people that write. That would be that would be really nice. But no, at the moment, no, not really. Those contacts in the groups are invaluable, though. So at least you've got some. Yeah, it's nice, uh, and I'm hoping as time goes on that will grow as well, and I will get to meet other authors. So you know, other people that write and uh, do similar thing to me especially a similar style as well I think that's nice and um, if you were a character in your books which character would you like to be mm. do you know in my books I don't think I'd want to be any of them because <laughs> no they all they're all they all carry so much baggage and uh, because it's a thriller, they're all damaged in one way or another. You know, they've all got so much um, backstory to them. I don't think I would, would want to have experienced anything like I've put my characters through. Um, I like the morals, I think, of um, my two lead characters, um, Mel and Mike. They are such a strong, not, they're not, they're such a, a strong detective duo. They're very supportive of one another and they look out for one another. They watch one another's backs. And when I was writing them and I was creating them, I really wanted the audience to love them, like them and root for them. I, you know, in contrast, I wanted them to really hate the villain, but I really wanted them to really warm to them and love them. And I think that um, they are such a, a lovely, lovely couple. You really relate to them. So I think I'd want to have their morals and their standing, but I wouldn't want to necessarily want to be them because of what they've gone through, which is really, really <laughs> tragic. So, yeah, wouldn't want to be them, but I, I'd want to have their, their good standing and their morals. Yeah, I think this is the right answer to that question <laughs> because you know the chances of surviving in some of these novels is quite slim Absolutely. so I'm always surprised when people answer I, I wouldn't want to be in any of them <laughs> no definitely not and <laughs> um, what's the most interesting thing you found when doing research well my books um some of my characters are very, very heavily damaged and need a lot of psychiatric help. So um, I had to do an awful lot of medical research um, to be able to report on their findings and, and their progress, you know, to, 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 you know, to charter their progress. It, I had to learn a lot of things. And it was really quite scary going out there uh, on the internet and, 
you know, looking at all the different uh, things that can go wrong with the mind and the offshoots of that is just incredible. In fact, the things that I've had to Google to, to do my <laughs> books is extraordinary. I wouldn't, wouldn't want my laptop stolen. If someone looked at my history, they'd think I was a real weirdo. <laughs> but, but you have to say, you know, like one of my things was, you know, how long does it take for a body to decompose and all the different stages? And I thought, oh, fancy finding that on your history. But if you're writing about it, you need to know what happens next, etc. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, lots of, lots of medical research, I think, is, um, is probably the most interesting thing, definitely. Yeah, I, I find if you're a forensic science student, research history is equally dodgy, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also the stages of decomposition it's fine <laughs> oh, oh my word when I was uh, doing a scene in Gordon Square I was freaking myself out as I was typing it was just incredible because I must admit when when I'm writing it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing I actually lock myself away for hours uh, well unless I'm in the sunshine which is my favorite place to write but I actually um shut the door on the world so to speak and I write from I do marathon writes of 10 hour stints and I really get in this really heavily get in the zone and um it's extraordinary because you don't take on the character but you feel their emotions and everything when you're doing it it's it's really strong how you feel definitely um what's your biggest fear and would you write about it Oh God, I've got loads actually. Um, would I write about it? Um, don't know that I would. I think I would frighten myself to death. I've spook myself out now with stuff I do. I don't know that I would probably want to put my worst fears on paper, to be honest. I think that would be a little bit too, too scary for me to do so I'd probably leave that one alone <laughs> also a sensible answer <laughs> and a correct answer I think. <laughs> uh, do you hide any secret jokes or messages in your books only a few people will understand yeah I have put in there a couple of street names that would be really really poignant to some family members that only they would pick up on so um and a couple of them have you know said to me straight away uh, and uh, a few uh, friends have mentioned it as well so that so that's one thing a few little personal bits but um alcoholic beverages <laughs> one of my um one of my main characters in my sequel, Arlington Terrace, um, the, one of the um, villains, so to speak, is, um, I've called him after my uh, favourite gin. <laughs> my favourite tipple. So he's called Topaz. So uh, that's his surname. And that's worn out of uh, my favourite gin. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of um, anagrams and things from the cocktail cabinet so yeah <laughs> so there's amazing. a few little things in there that people that know me would pick up on definitely <laughs> I love it that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should move my writer's desk away from it before Johnny Walker <laughs> comes along <laughs> uh, yeah well I know someone that named their characters after old Chelsea football players so I'm sure it's no better or worse than that <laughs> I think we've all got a way of doing things. Sometimes I'm, we're driving along. My husband does most of the driving because I, I tend to come up with some of my storylines first thing in the morning, really early, because uh, we work together. So when we're uh, doing the long stint on the M1, and um, my husband's concentrating on the drive. I'm off in like a fantasy world, you know, working out where I'm going next. And um, it, it's just extraordinary, the, the things that you come up with. Uh, you know, when when you're en route, it's, you know, I, one minute I'm doing one thing, the next minute I'm doing another. It, I've lost track of where I was going now as well. This, that's how I write, actually. It's extraordinary because <laughs> I, I'm, I'm leading one way. I think sometimes that's how I get a good twist. 
because I think the audience think she's traveling in one direction and then <laughs> we're off it's the other way. So. But um, yeah, I, I think I do a lot of my uh, lot of my best thinking first thing early in the morning. So I've gone off track again, haven't I? <laughs> I've gone off track again. <laughs> That's fine. Um, if you were able to spend a day with any author, dead or alive, who would you like to spend a day with? Oh, who would I like to spend the day with? Well, when I go on holiday, uh, Jojo Moyles normally comes with me in my suitcase. Um, but I don't ne now know whether she would be my, my choice because... I now like psychological crime so much and I'm so intrigued by it and, and fluffy romance to me now um, has sort of been put on the shelf a bit and all this like crime stuff is taken over. So I think, I don't know if I'd be brave enough to go with Stephen King, but uh, I don't even know what he looks like actually. I don't know if he's handsome or uh, old or what really, I can't remember, but I do like a lot of what he puts together and Salem's lot as, as a youngster when I was back in my 20s, I used to love, oh, I think I've read that novel about five times. So uh, if I was feeling brave, I might have half an hour in his company. <laughs> That'd go for the day, pick his brains. Yeah, yeah. He's he been through some stuff as well, so. Yeah, he has actually, yeah. It'd be my choice, absolutely no question. Oh, you, you would look like that as well. Good, we're in good company then. Yes, I mean, he's amazing. He is, he's definitely amazing. <laughs> I'm assuming that he doesn't suffer from imposter syndrome as well, like a lot of authors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope he doesn't go off course as much as me. <laughs> yes. I always do that. I start a conversation and end up totally uh, doing something else. I think that's a woman thing, isn't it? I'm pretty sure that's a woman thing because yeah. I do the same. <laughs> yeah, I think we all do. We all go, of course. Yeah, it's fun. You learn so much more that way. <laughs> when you go off on <laughs> it's so much more interesting not knowing where you're going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is why I don't like scripting interviews. When I first started, I scripted them, but it's much more fun not to. <laughs> yeah. But you start off and then you don't, because things uh, actually just pop into my head as I'm thinking of, oh, I bring that bit into it. By the time I've brought that bit into it, I've forgotten where I was uh, <laughs> heading in the first place. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting in my books that way. Yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> um, so what do you read? What's some of the best stuff you've read recently? Um, I haven't, I'm reading, I am reading at the moment, actually. Um, a, a book which is um, it's very very it's quite scary actually what I'm reading at the moment but uh, other than that I haven't read for a, a while because writing time is so precious and we get so little time to be able to actually be able to sit down and because I like to write in marathon writes a lot of um people I know when I chat on my forums, they say that they can be quite disciplined and they can do a little bit before work or they can come home and do a little bit before they cook the evening meal. And I can't do that because I'm the sort of person that spends such a long time. I read the chapter I've just written and then I read the one before that and then I get in the zone of it. So I can't actually, So it's, it's hard to explain. I, I just need the length of time to do it. So I write for such long periods of time, which is why Sunday is my day. So um, I don't get a lot of time for reading because if I'm going to devote 10 hour stints to doing what I'm doing, I, I don't actually read. So what I'm actually doing at the moment, I'm reading to and from work. Okay. So um, even though I'm writing um, the, the trilogy, uh, to my thriller series at the moment. I've actually taken that off the off the uh, agenda for the moment and I'm taking time out to read another book because I think it would be quite refreshing because I've got very much caught up in my crime series that I'm, I'm just going to take a little bit of it, even though I've written the prologue to, to the uh, 
to the trilogy of this particular series. Um, I'm I'm not um, I'm not going to kill my characters off. I don't think I'm going to bring them bring another detective series in with the same group of people. I'm pretty determined to do that. But I, but before I finish this particular case, which is three books long, I'm uh, uh, yeah going to have a little break. I'm going to go back to it, and um, I'm going to go back to it as soon as I finish the book that I'm reading at the moment. So yeah, I don't, I don't, other than that, I read on holiday if I'm not writing myself <laughs> sitting on the balcony. Um, would you give any of your characters in your series their own spin-off? Would I give any of your characters their own spin-off? But well. Um, the, the two main characters, um, they, they're going to, a spin-off really, they're going to go on and they're going to do other cases. They, they've been quite well received and a lot of people are rooting for Mel and Mike. So um, when I've written the trilogy, I want to actually take them through to another case. Whether, at the moment, I don't know whether there'd be a, there could be a strong enough character to go off and do something tragic in an independent one but I'm not sure because I think that when I next embark on a new a new completely separate set of thrillers that don't relate to these two detectives I don't know whether it's actually going to be detective related there will obviously be an element of there for a crime but I don't know whether I'll focus more on the villain as opposed to the actual, you know, I don't know where I'm going to come from on that one yet, because I'm still wrapping up this one, and also I've got a few other ideas of other cases that they can move on to. So, um, yeah. That's my best answer for that one, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, what do you do when you to celebrate when you finish writing a book? Crack open a bottle of Prosecco. <laughs> <laughs> well that's what I had to do with Arlington Terrace so um because obviously we were in lockdown um well we were in lockdown for both my books really because although I wrote Gordon Square when we wasn't in lockdown it was released during lockdown so I couldn't go out and play and <laughs> Arlington Terrace was written during lockdown so I definitely couldn't there either so um but we, we've definitely cracked a bottle and um, I thought right that's it it's, it's delivered and then you sit and you panic and you say oh, especially when I was right now in Terrace I thought oh my god you know when you write the second one you it's a, it's a worry as to whether it's going to be well received you know as um, the first one you just don't know what's going to happen it's the, the, the responsibility is huge so the pressure <laughs> And do you get much feedback from your readers? Um, Gordon Square went on a blog tour. Um, it went on a blog tour a while back and um, I got some lovely feedback from it. I was really, really excited because you just don't know what people are going to say. Because it's a bit gruesome and it's a delicate um, subject. I was a bit nervous and I thought, oh God, it's such a dark crime, you know, what, what will happen when I put it out there, how will it perceived? Because um, we also deal with a really tragic event with the detectives as well. And, um, you know, it's, there's some trigger factors in there and I, thought, well, I don't know how it's going to be received. And it's really nerve wracking. So when um, uh, people were coming back and they were saying, oh, I couldn't put it down once I started and, it was the best feeling. It really, really was um, an amazing feeling. So um, when, when I was uh, writing Arlington Terrace, the pressure, I think, oh, but how can you make this one as intense? Because the actual nitty gritty crime was done. It's been delivered. And now you're sort of continuing um, what happens next, what happens not only with the detective, and they, they kind of circle back round to the original case in a sense, and um, it's given the book an identity of its own, um, so that it, you're not repeating yourself, but then like coming back and covering off things that, that people mentioned, because people kept saying, oh, I want to know what happened with such and such, and what happened with so and so. 
And what, you know, there, there were so many elements that people were asking me questions and, and I kind of felt I needed to deliver a lot of those along the way. So that, that was really quite hard, making sure that I didn't leave it, anything out. And did I deliver enough on it? Did I give them enough of an explanation? So um, that, that's really been, yeah, is on. Especially with the third one, I think that I'm doing now. That's definitely, um, I think, this one because it will actually finish this case. I think that it needs to it needs to have some punch behind it. So um, I'm not sure I need to have a few sleepy moments in the car on the way to work to actually yeah, put this one together, I think. At least it wasn't bad feedback, so it could have been worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, a few, a few people were a little bit, uh, thought it was a bit delicate, but um, you, you can't have a fluffy crime. They are going to be gritty. That is what a psychological thriller is. It is going to, you know, it's going to pull on your heartstrings. It is going to be tough. And uh, I hope for, I hope that I delivered it in the most sympathetic way. And I'm hoping that the detect. Well, I, I think the detectives did an amazing job in there. And um, like I said, the, mor the morales, that I, the characters that I've actually created for them. Um, you know, it comes from the heart, how they deal with it. It really, it really does. <laughs> um, who was your first celebrity crush? Oh my God. Oh, I'm a grandmother, so we've got to go back a long way. <sighs> Probably someone like David Cassidy. <laughs> Someone like that. I was uh, the. Uh, I was never allowed to hang uh, pop star posters up on my bedroom wall. My mum wouldn't have that. She wouldn't have the wallpaper ruined. So I used to have them inside my wardrobe door. And I remember he hung in there. So yeah, probably, <laughs> um, probably him. So yeah. Although, although I hate to actually say it, quite like Leo Sayer. <laughs> Isn't it wrong with that? <laughs> yeah, I loved his first hit. I bought the single. I think it cost me about 30p back when. But um, yeah. So that would uh, that would be back in the 70s. <laughs> I'm sure you're not Very alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard I've heard uh, David Cassidy mentioned a few times. So Oh have you? Yeah. <laughs> And if you were inviting four famous people to a dinner party, who are you inviting? Mm. Four famous people. Well, I hope my husband's cooking for a start. And I'm not because I like to set the scene. I like to do the beautiful dinner table and set the scene and everything. And I like and Ian likes to do the cooking side of it. I like to do the dessert because I like the creative stuff. So I like to decorate the cake so I could do that. But who would be sitting? at my dinner table. Mel Gibson, probably, because I love uh, watching him. Um, mm, who else would be sitting at that dinner table? Oh, there's a brilliant lady I like watching in her thriller. She's in the fall, Gillian, um, ooh. Oh God, I can't think of her surname now, but I love her detective work and what she does. And she actually relates to the villains. In fact, she had a crush on one of them, but I can't think of her surname now. So um, we'll have, she won't be able to come through the front door because we can't remember her surname. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who I would have at my dinner table. Can be dead or alive, fictional, anyone. It's your dinner party, you can have who you like. <laughs> it is my dinner party, and I can cry <laughs> if I want to. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Husband, I don't know who's coming. <laughs> Let, let's think who could come. Dennis Quaid, maybe. Oh, I'm going for all the lads. It's an all it's an all lads <laughs> dinner party here. So hmm. James Bond, maybe. Hmm. David Craig, 
great David, David Craig, I always get it the wrong way round. Actually love, yeah, I think it's going to be an all man dinner party here. <laughs> you sure you want your husband cooking? <laughs> um, he might have to go out. <laughs> No, they, they wouldn't want to eat if I was certain. Right, they probably would, but I'd have to do something very simple. So, or you could just order takeaway, be safe. <laughs> <laughs> I could have a, a a famous person pull up on a delivery motorbike. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and just invite them in, have a big old. Yeah, they can crash. take the full place at the dinner table. <laughs> Um, what superhero power would you choose if you could have one? What superhero power would you choose? Ah, oh, probably to know what people are thinking because I'm so nosy. I'm <laughs> so nosy. I like to get inside heads. I like to know what's going on. So yeah, I'd like the power to know what what's uh, what's going on in people's minds. I think it's quite popular, actually. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Don't want to be predictable. No. <laughs> or common. <laughs> I think probably one of the coolest answers with being able to speak every language. I quite like the idea of that. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a cool one. I've got a little bit of um, Italian in mine, just a, a wincy bit because I've got an Italian waiter and I did a little wincy bit, but I had to look it all up and copy it very, very carefully over to make sure I've got all the little. <laughs> quotes in the right place but yeah I don't speak any language I just speak Spanish so because uh, because uh, we bought this lovely little place out in Spain he's determined to learn the lingo so but I haven't yet no I I'll just sit back and let him do the ordering in the restaurants <laughs> <laughs> well if you trust him why not <laughs> yeah he knows what I eat while I drink <laughs> Awesome, yeah, you don't need to learn this <laughs> No, he knows we like to start with a sangria. Absolutely, you have to, it's the law, surely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's coming next for you? Well, I'm writing the third in the series. So, um, Gordon Square and Arlington Terrace both took just over a year to complete. So I've I've written the prologue, as I've said, for uh, my new book. I haven't named it yet. It's work in progress. So um, I've got I've got a name that I'm calling it at the moment, which isn't really going to be its name, but it's just so that I've got something to refer to it as. So because I know that that's going to take at least a year, that's going to be where my head's at. Going to um, be bringing that hopefully to the table probably early next year February March somewhere around then I anticipate sort of being ready so that's where I'll be I'll be in my little locking myself away most Sundays and if mm -hmm. I've got something on on a Sunday when the world opens mm -hmm. I'll switch it to a Saturday otherwise I have to wait to the following weekend because it just it has to be a long marathon one I can't just tip my tip tip my toe in the water, dip my toe in the water, I should say, um, for a short spell, because then I can't feel my characters, emotions and everything. And I, I just can't write that way. So it has to be a long stint. <laughs> so a long stint every weekend now, between now and the next year. <laughs> well, I don't think I have any more questions for you, unless you think there's anything I haven't asked that you want to tell us. Um, no, just that I really hope that um, people give Gordon Square and um, Arlington Terrace a go. Like I said, it is a, it is a dark crime, um, but um, I hope I've delivered it the, the best way possible. And um, I really hope that uh, people enjoy it. Uh, and I'm really grateful for you for interviewing me today. You're very Thank welcome. you very, very much. Pleasure. So before we go, do you just want to tell everyone where they can find out more about you and where they can find your books? <laughs> yep, um, my books are available on Amazon and I do have a website which is www.tracymartinsummers.co.uk So you'll find more about me on there and um, like I said, both my books, I 
can show you. Both my books, Arlington Terrace and Gordon Square, are here. So um, yeah, I hope people go on and uh, give them a give them a whirl. I really do hope so. Well, I'm intrigued. And please leave me a review. <laughs> I'll be reading them. So if I read them, then I'll uh, I'll review it on my page anyway. So. Yeah. Oh, thank you very, very much indeed. I'm very grateful for you having me today. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> thank you.